that structure works for me. Um, but there have been a few comments about the history of zoning that I wanted to respond to before going into bullet yeah. point. Please. Um, yeah, I mean, because they sort of dominated the public, the, the written comment. Um, so I am um, really glad that we last talked about the petition. There's been this burst of interest in learning more about the history of zoning in Cambridge. Um, several people who spoke in the video from Charlie Sullivan that he gave before the Cambridge Court Neighborhood Association. Um, and there were several written comments and op-eds that reported to describe the history of zoning in Cambridge. And as a professional historian who teaches local government law, I am delighted by the public enthusiasm. Um, in fact, I would encourage everybody to learn more about the history of zoning. It's super interesting. Um, the Cambridge Library maintains archives of the Cambridge Chronicle and the Cambridge Tribune and the Cambridge Press. I bet you didn't even know there was a Cambridge Press and the Cambridge Sentinel. Um, and it also has wonderful books on the history of zoning. Um, so you can find Kianga Yamada Taylor's Racer Prophet. You can find Mark Doherty's Golden Gates. Uh, you can find Jessica Tronstein's Segregation by Design um, in the Shadow of the Ivory Tower by Baldwin. Saving America Cities by Elizabeth Cohen. Uh, Richard Rothstein's Color of Law. Um, classics like Bernard Segan's Land Use Without Zoning, John Bean's Zoned Out, Sonia Hertz Zoned in the USA. There are a lot of books written about the history of zoning. And what these histories extensively document is the deep tie between zoning and racial and class segregation. Density-based zoning did not exist before 1916. The only type of zoning that existed was racial zoning began in San Francisco, it spread elsewhere. And after the Supreme Court outlawed racial zoning in 1917, density-based zoning, like what we're currently debating, proliferated across almost every city and suburb in America. Richard Rothstein's book describes how city planners embraced density-based zoning as a racially method of enforcing segregation by excluding the construction of apartment buildings from wealthy neighborhoods, Jessica Tronstein describes how advocates of zoning based a social Darwinist understanding. I believe one of the commenters said he doesn't want to see survival of the fittest. That is what the planners of uh, the Cambridge Planning, I mean the Cambridge Planning Board, embraced when they described the purpose of zoning and how the unsanitary habits and homes of poor people spread epidemic disease. Ira Katz Nelson has described how federal housing programs in the 1930s fortified zoning decisions by withholding home loans and mortgage insurance from neighborhoods that were integrated or disproportionately non-white, the practice known as redlining. Kianga Yamada Taylor has described how in 1966, Martin Luther King protested snob zone ordinances in all white cities with few black people, only to be met with the same response we're hearing now, that density-based zoning has nothing to do with race, but designed to prevent the burdens and harms to property values uh, if poor people were allowed to move in. Uh, Jessica Tronstein, again, has described how early adopters of zoning want to become more segregated along both race and class lines than similarly situated cities without early zoning plans, like Houston, which has never embraced zoning. And Bernard Segan, in his book about Houston in 1972, described how at that point, Houston had more apartments and more housing generally available for rent or purchase than other comparable cities, especially on uh, the coasts, where land use regulations had proliferated. Um, and in Houston, as old housing uh, you know, became older and older, it became more affordable as it aged because richer residents moved into newer construction. Rents were lower in Houston. The housing market was dynamic in Houston. And that was 1972. The difference since then has only grown exponentially. Um, and I should also mention Hakeem Jefferson's recent piece to how white Americans express the discomfort of being associated with either racism or privilege. Um, and, you know, some of the responses uh, include denying that inequality exists um, instead of working to dismantle the systems that sustain the privilege in the first place. So all that said, I won't repeat what I saw last meeting about how Cambridge has participated in all of these national trends, but I've seen two arguments surface today and in the last five weeks that I don't think should stand without comment from this board. 
Uh, so first, some people have argued that stench, not discrimination, was the catalyst for the three process that led to Cambridge's zoning ordinance. This argument contends that the only purpose of Cambridge's 1924 zoning ordinance was to prevent the construction of factories. And I assume the implication is to prevent the construction of factories near residences. The evidence for this argument is a 1920 headline in the Boston Globe that postdates Cambridge's zoning ordinances. But even if it were true that Cambridge had adopted zoning to eliminate factories, all this argument would explain is why Cambridge zoned by use, separating residential areas from industrial areas. It has nothing to do with why today or in 1924, Cambridge zoned by density by separating all white single family neighborhoods in West Cambridge from the majority black and immigrant neighborhoods of East Cambridge, Cambridgeport and the port. Proponents in Cambridge were explicit about their purposes. The purpose density requirements were in a 1922 Cambridge Tribune article to create exclusive districts where nothing but two and a half story dwellings are allowed. According to the Cambridge Tribune in 1922, it was to prevent apartments in certain sections in a 1919 article called The Purpose of Zoning, the Cambridge Tribune explained, free from any fear of invasion from garages, stores, or apartment houses, the homeowners in these districts will settle down to enjoy the relief which the zoning resolution has given them. Absent a zoning resolution, the article warned, here is a quiet residential street improved with private dwellings. If zoned now, the street may be maintained for detached houses. Wait until next year to adopt a zoning scheme and the erection of two or three tenements will place it in the tenement house class. Cambridge adopted an ordinance to ban triple deckers and not just with the zoning ordinance, it just banned triple deckers outright as did most of the cities in Boston area. Uh, Cambridge ended up amending the triple decker ordinance uh, in 1922 to allow the construction of triple deckers only with the assent of 75% of nearby property owners. Supporters of the triple decker ordinance were the same people behind the 1924 zoning ordinance. Um, one of them was a Harvard professor, I'm sorry about that, who testified that the two ordinances were in perfect accordance. Um, in 1924, after the zoning ordinance was passed, the owner, there's an article about how the owners of property on Fresh Pond Parkway and Hawthorne Avenue in the exclusive Larchwood district are up in arms over the plan to erect, right in the heart of that section, a 24-family apartment block. The people of that section sought that locality for their residents because of its freedom from apartment houses and two and three deckers, and quite a colony of fine single dwellings have been built. They complained that the new apartment violates the new zoning ordinance in the district, which is restricted to single and two family houses. So that's all to say that the purpose of the zoning ordinance in Cambridge was not about health and safety. Second, uh, and, and I think a more insidious argument that I've heard over the past five weeks are comments suggesting that housing discrimination did not exist in Cambridge, that redlining has nothing to do with race, which is just a really bizarre comment, um, and uh, other suggestions that zoning and redlining have to do with one another or have anything to do with race. And I think that a lot of these comments, including a comment today suggesting that the missing middle petition is modern day redlining, have a pretty severe misunderstanding of what redlining means. So redlining, just to be clear, it refers to a practice that began in the late 1930s. So after the zoning ordinance was passed, uh, it was initiated primarily by the Federal Housing Authority, a New Deal program, and it guaranteed mortgages for homeowners looking to purchase homes in certain neighborhoods. Uh, but the FHA's definition of a sound neighborhood was a racially segregated neighborhood and the FHA refused to guarantee mortgages for black people in integrated neighborhoods, uh, in addition to encouraging white homeowners to racially restrictive covenants. And so what redlining refers to are the figurative and literal red lines that FHA uh, aid were trying to figure out whether to guarantee mortgages drew around certain neighborhoods. Um, uh, out of the fear that they would lose value if black people or poor people uh, moved in or certain immigrants moved in. And um, I think what everyone in the past five weeks has Googled is you can see some early maps that were drafted in the 1930s by a different federal agency, the Homeowner Loan Corporation, the HOLC, 
uh, which is a map that shows the green and blue and red areas of Cambridge, uh, the HOLC that is not redlining, that was the HOLC that created maps and used by the FHA and the FHA banks and insurance companies engaged in racial discrimination with respect to guaranteeing mortgages in homes and otherwise providing credit for 40 years afterward through the 1960s on a theory that poor people were bad credit risks and the presence of lowered real estate values. So the connection between all of this, which is redlining and zoning, is that the FHA correctly interpreted density-based zoning restrictions as a strong barrier to racial and economic integration. It therefore looked favorably on exclusively zoned neighborhoods and reinforced existing housing patterns, including the housing patterns that had been uh, written into stone by the 924 zoning ordinance and subsequent amendments. And redlining was federal policy that lasted through 1967 when congressional hearings in Alabama, no, Baltimore, no, Boston testified that this practice was pervasive around Boston and around the country. And Congress ended up banning mining after this initial hearing in Boston with the 1968 Civil Rights Act, which prohibited the withholding of loans on the basis of race. And I think these two arguments are worth combating in detail because first, there is this idea that what history represents is just looking and finding, you know, a article that supports you. I would really strongly encourage you all to read a book, to go to the library and look this up because I'm not making this up. And the historians who have documented this in detail are not making this up either. Um, but I also think that, uh, you know, the, the prevalence of these two arguments over the past five weeks is just a really exceedingly narrow definition of discrimination. Uh, this idea that laws and policies are racially or economically discriminatory only when the people who opted those policies literally say, I am doing this because I am a racist snob. I think that's a definition of discrimination that would look at, you know, Dunn's Muslim ban and say, well, he says he's doing this for national security reasons, so I guess we have to listen to him. Or the same idea that looks at a Fortune 500 company and says, well, I don't see that it has any women managers, but that must be because women don't like being managers, as opposed to actually, no, there's a structural problem there that we should probably fix. And so at this point, given all of the countless studies that have described how zoning contributes to racial segregation, how zoning contributes to economic segregation, how zoning contributes to climate change, I think the bottom line is we have to ask ourselves, in light of all the problems that zoning causes, why do we keep it? Why do we continue to make it illegal to build dense housing? And so when we go through these 10 bullet points, just like the rest of the board to imagine for a moment that we abolished residential zoning. So just imagine that we're Houston or some city that does not have residential zoning. It's legal to build any type of housing anywhere, so long as it complies with building codes and safety requirements. And now as we're imagining this city, that does not have residential zoning, I'd like just to imagine what sort of housing we want built. I think we could get a pretty strong majority, not just on the planning board, but across the city, uh, you know, as, as indicated by Envision Cambridge, that we would want affordable, dense housing for middle income and working families. We want to make Cambridge livable. We want people to be able to afford to live. This is the sort of housing we would want to encourage. And so then I think we should ask ourselves, if we are in a city that does not have zoning, and we want to encourage the creation of affordable housing, would we accomplish that goal by adopting a law that bans the construction, dense housing in West Cambridge? I don't think so. That is the current plan. That is this quote. We can call that plan down. Plan down makes it illegal to build triple deckers anywhere in West Cambridge, even on sites that already have triple deckers built on them. If you live there and knock it down, you can't rebuild it. I think a better plan, we can call it plan up or you know, just any alternative, would be to make it as easy as possible to build dense, affordable housing. I think we would try to encourage mixed use neighborhoods. 
within walking distance of jobs and street life. That's what Envision Cambridge calls for. And that is not what we currently have with our existing zoning rule. So I support this ordinance and I support the amendments to the extent that this gets us closer to what the city has said we want. We want affordable housing. We should not discourage and make illegal the construction of dense housing in West Cambridge. And I do think this is a racial justice issue. I think this is an economic justice issue. This is a housing justice issue. I think none of the objections that I've heard to this explain how we contribute to justice by banning the construction of triple deckers in West Cambridge. I don't get it. But I do get how constructing more housing and making more livable space in the city will reduce prices and make it more affordable. And so I hope that we have that in mind as we go through uh, the, the 10 bullet points. Thank you. Thank you, Nico.